Hey, up. Um, right, I, I didn't get the filming done for the Himalayan uh, this week. Uh, we were treated to some spectacular hailstorms yesterday when I was hoping to film it, so it's going to be next week now. Now, just going back to my little trip on the Himalayan on Saturday, we did about a you know, 100 mile round trip to York uh, in pouring rain, so you couldn't see much of the scenery because it was obscured by rain and clouds and you were sort of concentrating directly ahead of you because of the rain hazard, uh, trying to work out what the traffic was doing ahead. Whilst trying to drink in every shred of information I possibly could about the Himalayan 450, because I've got to do a review on it at some stage, and it's pitched as a sort of an adventure tourer, and it's only got one cylinder. And most people don't consider that that's enough cylinders for a touring machine. Now, you know, like everybody in my younger days, um, I migrated up to four-cylinder motorcycles, and I found them a bit soulless. In fact, I got them out of my system by the late 1980s. In fact, you know, looking back, I'm not really sure what the attraction was. I, th I think it was mainly they had four cylinders, so they sounded like a car. And for some reason, as a younger man, that seemed important. I've got no idea why now. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to put them to one side. I'm not going to talk about them in this video because we're just going to concentrate on the difference between a single and a twin. Because it comes up literally all the time in the comment section. Now, there's sort of two classes of comment, if you like. There's the ones that say... A uh, twin is better than a single, and there's the ones that say a single is better than a twin. And then there are the ones that are asking the question, you know, which is better, a single or a twin? And during that journey, I also started to ponder the fact that in the last five years or so, I've migrated from twins, which had always been my preference for the last, you know, 20, 30 years. I'd migrated over to singles, and I prefer singles, and I wasn't sure why. You know, I've had a few singles over the years. In fact, you know, I've swapped and changed between singles and uh, twins over the years. And I, I think I really fell in love with the classic 500. That's when single cylinder bikes really got under my skin. And then I got the classic 350, which was, uh, it wasn't love at first sight. It took a while, but... You know, it, again, that bike has now really got under my skin. But then I got the BSA 650, which really cemented, I think, my love of singles. And then, you know, I was on this Himalayan, and I was absolutely loving it. I mean, I don't watch other people's reviews, as you know, because I, I don't want my opinion of a bike to be coloured by what other people have said. But... I understand it's had a bit of a slating only through uh, you know comments that have been passed to me on various videos. Videos I, I understand, you know, it, it's not rated very highly, but I, I was struggling to see why. You know, like all bikes, it's not a perfect bike, but I was struggling to understand why people apparently don't like it. Anyway, getting back on track, the difference between a single and a twin. I think, you know, we're conditioned as humans, or maybe it's innate, I, d I don't know. You know, more is always better, bigger is always better. Uh, two cylinders are better than one cylinder. I remember back in 1983, it will have been, um, I was looking to buy my first brand new motorcycle. It had to be a 125 because of the learner laws. And I was torn between the Honda 125 Super Dream, which was a twin, and the Suzuki GS125, which was a single. Now, I'd just got my first job in the police force, or first proper job anyway, full-time job. And this bike had to serve me to get me to work, to do all my socialising. And I wanted to go touring two up. And I just didn't know which of the two bikes to buy. So... I asked my dad the question, you know, he was a, a long-term motorcyclist, he'd ridden throughout the 40s and the 1950s, I think he sort of changed over to cars in the early 1960s, or it might have been the late 50s, I don't know. And I remember I was standing in the kitchen looking at the two brochures uh, for these two bikes, and I turned to my dad and I said, Dad, you know, I want a bike that's good for touring, which is going to be better for touring? 
a twin or a single. Now, after he'd stopped laughing at me, um, he gave me a very simple answer. Uh, a twin will probably get you there a little bit faster, but a single will get you there more economically. And in the end, I got the GS125, the single. I never regretted it. Um, it was cheap to run, cheap to service. I mean, back in those days, all bikes needed to have a, a full service every 3,000 miles. And I can't remember now exactly how many miles I did on that bike in the couple of years that I had it, but I remember it was having to be serviced every two to three months. So, you know, I did quite a few miles on it. But I never regretted it, not for a moment. I think my main concern was durability. For some reason, I had it in my head that a single wouldn't be as durable, it wouldn't be as capable of handling distances as a twin was, but that you know, as it turned out, it was a lot of rubbish. We toured all over the UK, myself and my girlfriend of the time. We frequently used to do two up 1,200 miles, 1,400 miles tours to Scotland or, you know, down to Cornwall. We went everywhere on that bike. And it handled it perfectly. Um, I mean, it had a top speed of about 72 miles an hour in the right conditions. But we found that we could travel comfortably at 60 miles an hour on the motorway when we had to. Uh, no hassle at all. So I think the real answer is, you know, there is no answer to that. It's down to your personal preference. A, a single or a twin are just as good as each other, but they both have the pluses and the minuses. Or traditionally they have the pluses and the minuses, but I think the gap has closed a lot more closely than many people realise these days. Let's start with the twin. Um, it's a more complicated uh, piece of apparatus than a single. Obviously, it's got two cylinders, so there's more to it. So it tends to be more expensive to produce, and it tends to be a little bit heavier than a single might be. And it's also less economical to run. Inherently, they use more fuel, and the more time-consuming to service and so generally more expensive to service and repair but generally speaking it produces more peak power than an equivalent sized single is capable of producing inherently a twin will give you better top end high end performance many will say that the exhaust note of a twin is preferable to the exhaust note of a single but i think that's set down to the individual really but the main problem with the architecture of a twin is that that high-end extra performance comes at the expense of torque, low-end to mid-range performance. And I'll get into that a little bit later on. The other main advantage of a twin is that um, the two pistons, if you like, sort of cancel each other out when it comes to vibration. So generally speaking, the engine runs much smoother, um, sort of transferring much less vibration to the rider. And vibration can be painful and tiring. Now, in comparison, and again, I'll use the word traditionally, a single-cylinder motorcycle has much better low to mid-range performance. It's a very talky, grunty motoring experience. And although it is capable of high speeds, it tends to get a little bit out of breath the higher up you go. And, you know, it becomes more difficult to get high-end performance out of it. Also, traditionally, vibration becomes a problem, especially the faster you go and the higher capacity you make the motor. So... You know, they used to say back in the 1960s that the optimal size for a single-cylinder motorcycle was 350 cc's. Once you get bigger than that, the vibration becomes too much of a problem for the bike really to be a practical long-range touring machine. And really, that's the short list of negatives for the single-cylinder motorcycle because it tends to be much more fuel-efficient than a twin. Lighter and cheaper to produce because there are fewer moving parts. And also more economical to repair and to service because there are fewer parts to deal with when you're servicing the bike. So ultimately it should save you money when it comes down to maintenance. Now 
all of these things rang true um, 40, 50, 60 years ago. But like everything else, technology has progressed. Things have moved on. And priority for manufacturers and for customers alike have changed. Now, just going back to the 1990s, during the course of the 1990s, there were two motorcycles that I owned. One was a 500 Twin, a brand new Japanese 500 Twin, and one was a 10-year-old CCM Armstrong Harley Davidson. It's complicated. There were a lot of changes in ownership at the time. Uh, Single-cylinder ex-military bike, equipped with a Rotax engine. Now, that single-cylinder bike went like shit off a stick from zero to about 50 miles an hour. And after that, it got completely out of breath. It was also quite a vibey bike. Now, when you got on motorways and dual carriageways, it would get up to 70 miles an hour quite easily, but you were constantly having to input at the throttle because the slightest incline or headwind would drag the speed down and you were constantly having to compensate. But in many ways, it was a perfect bike in normal road traffic conditions, you know, A and B roads. The only time it felt a little bit lacking was on dual carriageways and on motorways. Although it could easily keep up with traffic, you did need to concentrate on the throttle to keep it there. By comparison, the 500 Twin was gutless below 50 miles an hour. Where it really shone was on dual carriageways and motorways. And I didn't spend a lot of time on dual carriageways and motorways. So I found that bike a bit of a pain in normal traffic conditions. You know, you had to work it hard in normal traffic just to go with the flow of the traffic. But being a twin, it was silky smooth at most engine speeds, but it was a little bit heavy on petrol. Now, that was then, and this is now, and manufacturers have learned over the years that if they're going to sell these bikes, they had to tweak things a little bit. For a start, um, a a twin-cylinder motorcycle today is much smoother than a twin-cylinder motorcycle of 40 years ago because, you know, technology's moved on. They've learned how to make them more refined and smoother. And in some ways, for me, that's detracted from the twin experience a little bit. They've become a little bit like the four-cylinder bikes of the 1980s in that they're a little bit too clinical and soft around the edges. They've lost a bit of character. Now, the other trick that manufacturers have picked up is they've learned to mitigate some of the problems with low and mid-range performance on twins. They haven't solved the problem completely, but they've learned to mitigate it and they've improved low and mid-range performance. But, again, it comes at the expense of top range performance. In real terms, a lot of modern twins don't realise the full power potential. The teeth have been pulled at the top end to compensate for the power at low and mid-range. You know, you've only got to look at something like the the, um, Triumph... Bonneville T120, it's actually got about the same power output and top speed of that old 500 twin that I had back in the 1990s. Yet to pull that trick off, they've had to increase cubic capacity to 1200 cc's to make it work. Now, if you're talking about two motorcycles of the same cubic capacity, comparing a twin with a single, obviously... The most obvious two motorcycles are the Interceptor 650 and the Gold Star 650 from BSA. A 650 single-cylinder motorcycle of 40 years ago would have been a, a torturous machine to ride, purely because of the vibration. But technology have brought in all sorts of vibration dampening mechanisms that are available to engine manufacturers today you know, balancing shafts, extra large flywheels, that kind of thing, which have actually brought the vibration down on the BSA to a negligible amount. It's still a very smooth motorcycle with just enough resonance to give it some character without it being uncomfortable or painful or in any way sort of derisory 
to the riding experience. In fact, it enhances the riding experience. Low to mid-range performance, it's like a rocket ship as far as a single-cylinder bike goes. Yes, it does trail off as you get up to higher revs, but what I mean is it starts to trail off after about 70 miles an hour, which is the legal speed limit in this country. You don't need to be going any faster. Not if you want to keep your license anyway. Now, I love the 650 Interceptor, but it is a clinically smooth motorcycle. Um, you know, I didn't have a problem with it when I first got it. I still don't have a problem with it now, but when you compare it to a well-tuned single-cylinder bike of the same, you know, engine capacity, it somehow feels a bit, you know, a bit vanilla, a bit bland you, you're not getting the engine feedback that tells you that you're riding a living breathing machine the same way that you do with the bsa now some people want that i, I accept that um and there's nothing wrong with that some people want a smooth flawless ride personally for me it just feels a bit dead and of course they've had to pull this bike's teeth i mean a 650 twin, even an air-cooled one, should be capable of a peak 60 brake horsepower at least. But Royal Enfield have had to, again, pull its teeth and bring it down to around about 47 brake horsepower. So that they've got the ability to compensate at low end to boost low and mid-range performance. And although Royal Enfield have done a really good job with the Interceptor 650 engine, bearing in mind it's now a seven-year-old design, it just starts to get fun as you're running out of the legal limit. So its inherent strength starts to become available to you just as you reach the point where you're unable to use it. Now, if you live in the States where apparently highway speeds are 80 to 90 miles an hour, and if you go any slower than that, all the other traffic on the road runs you over. That's great. The um, you know the, the the parallel twin 650 Interceptor is the perfect bike for you. But the BSA will do it as well. But for the most of the rest of the world, the single cylinder is king, and that's why the Royal Enfield J platform bikes have done so well. Super smooth, refined, single-cylinder motorcycles that perform as well as you need them to perform. Again, you know, they've reduced the performance on these bikes for uh, reasons that I've discussed in other videos. But they are the perfect engine configuration for around town use and for open road where the roads are congested and, you know, top speed isn't really an issue. But despite the modern vibration damping technology that is built into these little singles and larger singles they've still got enough character to engage your soul while you're riding them the biggest motorcycle nations um on earth now are almost all exclusively within the uh, boundaries of asia and the most popular engine configuration in asia is the single cylinder bike with twins coming a second and multi-cylinder four cylinder bikes being almost unheard of now obviously i have sort of colored this video with my preferences and my preferences are for single cylinder machines now and i'm not in any way trying to say that you know parallel twins are uh, irrelevant nowadays they're not the you know the fantastic machines i've ridden parallel twins for years but what i'm saying is the big difference between the two that that gap that set them so far apart in the past has now closed up substantially it's no longer the night and day difference that it used to be so in answer to the question, especially when you're talking about, um, you know, modern classic roadsters of the type that I prefer, is, um, you know, which is the best, a, a parallel twin or a single, I would say they're both on par with each other with just very slightly different characteristics. 
Oh, and people keep asking me, is it true that the uh, Himalayan 450 really vibrates at 70 miles an hour? Uh, the answer to that question is no. Uh, there's no obtrusive vibration that I was aware of, and I did quite a bit of motorway work and dual carriageway work on it in the rain, uh, but we still managed to get it up to 70, and there was nothing adverse in the vibration department that I noticed. Full review coming up as soon as the weather allows. Once again, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this and my other videos and in doing so helping to support this channel. I really do appreciate it. I'd also appreciate it if you would leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you're not already a subscriber. You can help me out in other ways if you want via my Patreon page or the Super Thanks button down below. Either way, it's um, much appreciated, although not essential. I will, of course, be back next week. So until then, please ride safely. And I'll see you soon.